This episode is brought to you by Accenture. A better you starts with better hydration. Accenture is on a mission to inspire people to do what matters most. Their proprietary ionization process transforms water from any source into ionized alkaline water, providing water that's 99.9% pure with a pH of 9.5 or higher. Essentia Overachieving H2O, the number one ionized alkaline water. Shop now. Hi, everyone. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Welcome to Yoga Birth Babies, a podcast produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. We will be diving into everything prenatal yoga, birth, and baby related, hoping to inspire, educate, and empower you through your journey into motherhood. Thank you for listening. Hi, I'm Deb Blaschenberg, and I'm your host of Yoga Birth Babies. And if you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you know that anytime I can talk about the pelvic floor, it puts a smile on my face. So we are talking about pelvic organ prolapse and absolutely the role the pelvic floor plays in supporting those organs or maybe not supporting those organs so well. So to have this conversation, I have Janice Mitchell. She is a physical therapist with advanced training and certifications in women's health, biofeedback, and pelvic health. She began specializing in this area of physical therapy after the birth of her son in 1999, and she has seen profound impacts of pelvic floor PT on her own life, as well as that with countless patients over over the years. So Janice, first of all, she has the best enthusiasm for this topic and she goes through so much that makes it so understandable about what pelvic organ prolapse is. You're going to be shocked to find out how prevalent pelvic organ prolapse is. We talk about the symptoms. So you might think, mm, do I have that? We're going to go over that, how to check it, talk all about rehab and the healing process, as well as things that might worsen prolapse. So I am extremely excited for you you to listen to this conversation because if you have any sort of pelvic organ prolapse, there's things to do because we want your quality of life to be good. And if you're concerned about your pelvic floor and your pelvic organs, that can create more stress and that's not good for your pelvic floor. Now, before we get to my amazing conversation with Janice, let me just go over some things happening at PYC. So by the time you hear this, we'll be well into our fall schedule and we would have already added more classes. So we're adding more in-person classes while keeping online classes because I've made a commitment to continuing to offer well beyond New York City, and it's something I feel passionate about. Now, we also have our teacher training that would have started by the time you hear this, and that's our in-person training for the early fall. But the late fall is going to be online, and it's actually almost full. And then we have a winter, a January, February online, and then we'll be back up in person in March and April. So if you've been listening to the podcast and pre and postnatal yoga is really something that's speaks to you and you want to support the perinatal community in your area and you are a yoga teacher, check out our very in-depth 85 hour, well, it's more than 85 hours, but we'll call it 85 hour prenatal yoga teacher training. You can find that on our website at prenatalyogacenter.com. You can find our teaching schedule on our website. And we've also added a whole library of on-demand classes. So if you can't make it to one of our classes, but you still want to get the education and support, I've got that there for you. You can check all that out at our on-demand library. All right, the last thing I want to say, I guess, is thank you. Thanks for sticking around for over 20 years of our studio, and thanks for being our support. And if I haven't hit a topic that you want me to cover on the podcast, let me know. If I've maybe gone over that topic, but you want it maybe in a different perspective or go deeper into it, let me know. Email me at deb at prenatalyogacenter.com so I can make sure that I'm serving you what you want to hear week after week. All right. I think that's it. So I'm going to take a super quick break. When we come back, please enjoy my conversation with Janice. eBay Motors is here for the ride. With over 122 million parts, you can make sure your number one ride or die stays running smoothly. Brake kits, LED headlights, bumpers, whatever your baby needs, eBay Motors has it. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, it's guaranteed to fit your ride the first time, every time. Plus, at these prices, you're burning rubber, not cash. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. 
Hi, Janice. How are you? I am fantastic, Deborah. How are you? I'm doing great. I love your enthusiasm. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm so excited to talk about a topic that comes up a lot in class in my pre and postnatal classes. And I'll be honest, I had some pelvic organ prolapse myself. So this is a big topic. So I'm really excited to jump in. But I guess before we dive into all this, why don't you tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and how you ended up focusing on pelvic health? Yes. Well, I am a physical therapist first and foremost. And so I graduated in 95. I was working outpatient ortho and did some other things. And then 99, I had a baby and I had a severe perineal tear, which is, you know, where we tear uh, from the vaginal opening towards the anus there. And then I started having pelvic floor dysfunction after that. And uh, so I went to a class to learn more about how to fix myself and opened up this wonderful world of pelvic health. And it connected me with my anatomy in a way that I'd never known it before and function. And I just felt like, wow, you know, there's just different times in life where you have an epiphany. And, <laughs> wow, this is what I meant to be doing. And how can I know this information and not share it? with other people because it affects so many people. So really that was the transitional point in my life of choosing to specialize in pelvic health. And now we're going on, wow, like 22, 23 years. Amazing. It's gone really fast. So were you kind of self-diagnosed since you were already a physical therapist, were you self-diagnosing yourself? Really at that point, no. Like I just knew there were problems. Like I was leaking and I was in pain mm. <laughs> and, and I couldn't sit. And so I knew there were problems, but at that point, pelvic health wasn't talked about in PT yeah. school. Um, you know, we, we didn't get a list after we were have, you gave birth saying, here's some possible signs of pelvic floor dysfunction. I mean, ideally we would be giving lists now. It's still, you know, not as widely known as it could be, but I feel like we've gone, uh, gotten a lot better in terms of awareness and education than we were 25 years ago. Absolutely. Yeah. I've been doing prenatal, I've been in the perinatal world for a little over 20 years and I feel like in the last, I don't know, five, six years, there's been a lot more pelvic floor conversation yes. and, and, yes. and a new understanding, which is really exciting. So it really is. And I just, for everyone listening, like I want you to just take a, 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 a moment to think about what life was like 20 to 25 years ago. So I didn't have a cell phone. <laughs> I, we didn't have social media internet really. Maybe it was in your company, but you didn't have like home internet. This is like late nineties, early two yeah. thousands. So it was really like looking at the change and shift in our society and how, you know, information access has simply exploded as a result of the internet and social media. Yeah. I was telling my son, not to get too off topic, but he's 11. And I was telling him, I'm like, we used to have phones that were on the wall. He's like, what were they doing on the wall? It's just like, he didn't understand. It's like, why were they on the wall? Yes. It's, it's weird to have this great of a shift just in the last, you know, little bit. Yeah. Years, so. All right. So let's jump into pelvic organ prolapse. I've said that several times and people might be like, what is she talking about? So let's go very much to the foundation, like the basics. Yes. What yes. is pelvic organ prolapse and how prevalent is it? Yes. Okay. So we've got to just back up. I, I'm going to do my best to articulate the anatomy here first. And then once you know the anatomy, then pelvic organ prolapse comes in to affect the anatomy, right? So imagine your pelvis is like a bowl. The bones are the outside of the bowl. And then the bottom of the bowl are your pelvic floor muscles that kind of, uh, they're literally the floor of your pelvis. And then on top of that floor, you have three major organs. You have your, uh, sorry, your bladder in front where urine uh, comes out. Then you have your uterus and that's, you know, where babies grow. And then you have your rectum where poop and gas come out. And so each of those, if you can almost even think about them, like as water balloons, they're sitting on that floor and the floor is holding them up. And then each of those water balloons have a canal 
the exits through those muscles, okay? So it has to have a canal for the pee to come out, a canal for a baby to come out for vaginal deliveries, and then a canal for poop and gas to come out. Because, you know, all three of these organs have connections to the outside. So you have these three canals. All right. And the vagina is in the middle. The vagina is a canal that connects the outside to the uterus. All right. And so the pelvic organ prolapse is when that vaginal canal starts to uh, collapse a bit. So think about the bladder and its canal, the urethra, and the vaginal canal and the rectum. And they're side by side, all three of these canals, almost like bowling lanes. Okay. There are three canals, but then that bladder canal or the urethral canal starts to sag into the vaginal canal. And this is where, like, if you could just see my hands right now, (laughs) I'm very, very much of a props and a visual person. So, but just imagine that that canal is starting to drop into the vaginal, the, the front wall of the vagina is kind of collapsing with the bladder and the urethra coming behind it. So that's one type of prolapse. All right, okay. So I'm for people that are trying to visualize this, what I'm visualizing the way I've used my hands, it's like my hands are, uh, upright. My fingertips are pointing up. And if you're thinking of the bladder falling in, it's like one hand is kind of like bowing in. So it's kind of, is that how you would describe it? Yes, so it's, yes. it's like falling it's not, into itself. Like that, the vagina, the vaginal canal itself is starting to kind of collapse, collapse yeah. bulge. It's having a bulge, yeah. like a hernia almost, like a hernia in the vaginal canal. And so you could have a little hernia that where there's just a little bulge and it's really hard to see, or you could have a big hernia where that, that, uh, that part of the vaginal wall actually drops out of the vagina. And then you actually see like a tissue, some tissue there at the entrance of the vagina. Yeah. We can talk about that when we talk about the different grades and yeah. Yeah. All great. right. So that <laughs> is the cystocele. That's the bladder falling in. What about mm-hmm. the rectum? Yeah, so it's just the reverse. So it's where the back wall of the vagina, it starts to collapse down. So the rectum behind it uh, starts to, the, the vaginal wall, there just isn't enough support there for whatever reason. And the rectum is caving into the vagina. And so you have a little herniation there of that vaginal wall. Again, it's the vagina that you, that's actually collapsing. Um, and you're, or, you know, herniating and you're, you're like, if you're looking at it, cause when you look for, uh, prolapse, you're looking into the vagina. So you would see um, a small bulge or medium or large bulge, like we're going to talk about in a little bit. And then then the uterus can also prolapse. So those are the three main types of prolapse. And then the uterus is kind of like, if you think about um, like a sock, like a tube sock, and it's kind of turning in on itself. So if let's say you have a tube sock, okay, so visualize a long sock, you put your hand in it, and then you take your hand and at the toes, you pull that, that toe down and you keep the rest of the sock up. And so that top part is kind of coming down into the vagina. Can you see that? Deborah? I can. Yes. I'm okay. totally visualizing this. I okay. also have the advantage that I... <laughs> I know what you're talking about, but yes, I yes, can totally yes. And maybe we can, I have some videos that we could even, some videos that people could look. Perfect. So I'll put them in the show that. notes. That mm-hmm. way mm-hmm. when someone's hopefully, you know, if they listen to this driving, don't, don't look at it now, <laughs> but <laughs> when you're safely situated, right. take yes. a look at those videos. Uh-huh. So how prevalent are these different type of prolapses? Yes. So, the estimate is that um, 50% of people that have a vaginal delivery have some kind of prolapse. So, um, you know, that's one that's a significant people, amount. That's a significant amount. And then there was another study that said that showed like 75% of people that were studied women in this study had some degree of prolapse 
and they, most of them were asymptomatic. Like they didn't know that they had any kind of prolapse. So it's very common. Um, many people don't recognize that they have symptoms. So only 10 to 15% of people actually correlate their symptoms with, with, uh, prolapse or talk about it with their provider. But there's a lot of people out there that have prolapse. That's kind of crazy. So we went over the different types of prolapse, but what about the degrees of, I don't know what the word to say, I guess the grade of it, but like how bad it is, because you're saying, yes. you know, if that many people have it, but like 10 to 15% are asymptomatic, that means there's different levels of the situation. Right. Right. Absolutely. So like that, so going to our, our canal, so let's go to the vaginal canal and we're thinking about the bladder with that connects to the urethral canal and the a grade one is just a little herniation in that anterior wall. And it would be very difficult to see that on yourself. And it's very difficult even to see that as a provider. So grade ones are, are, very high and they're mild. And then a grade two comes, it, there's varying degrees of grade two, but a grade two comes to uh, just before the vaginal opening. You have something called the hymenal ring. So the hymen is like this, uh, you know, kind of tissue that uh, is at the entrance of the vagina. And there's all kinds of different Hymens. We could do a whole podcast just on hymens, <laughs> but the, kind of using that as a landmark when we're grading prolapse. And then a grade three would be where that bulge is coming past that hymenal ring. And you're seeing with a grade three, you're really, your tissue is visible uh, or, or you can feel it at the entrance of your vagina. And then grade four would be almost like you feel like you're sitting on a golf ball. Like mm-hmm. the grade four is coming out. There's a, there's tissue coming out of your vagina. Oh, I had, I think like between a two or three and it varied depending on when I looked. Cause I was often looking to see, yes, <laughs> like, I wanted to know so like, important. where that's, is it? That's an important point because people will, they'll see something, they'll feel something at home and then they go get checked and then they're lying on their back, you know, and the, yeah. and the provider says, Oh, you don't have one. But but they know that they're seeing something abnormal. They know that they're feeling something abnormal. So I just want to affirm anyone out there, like if you're having symptoms and you've gone to get checked, uh, don't don't settle with oh you don't have prolapse. Ask oh no, no, well, I went to your gynecologist. Like yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do, and <laughs> I worked yeah. with that person. But it was interesting how depending on the time of day, depending yeah. on if I was holding my baby, depending yeah. on what I'd been doing, where that prolapse was, it was significantly right. lower if I was trying to hold my baby for a long time, um, if I was out walking around, than if I was just waking up in the morning. So Absolutely. I think that's so interesting that it can, it can move and change. Yes, it definitely can. All right. So that's bladder prolapse. So then let's talk about the grades of, I guess, uterine and rectal. Yeah, they're all, they're all graded the same way. Okay. So with that hymenal ring. So a little, a little bulge is at the top. That's a grade one. If it comes to the hymenal ring, you know, there can be, uh, varying grade twos, but if it's past the hymenal ring, then that would be a grade three. And if it's outside, that's a grade four, uh, or, De- depending. So a grade three also can partially be outside, but if it's like a golf ball outside, that's a grade four. Ooh. So how, so we talked about that about 50 to 75%, depending on the study have some level of prolapse, but from your background, how often are you seeing it get to a three and four? How often are we seeing? Oh, that's a good question. Um, it's more common than you think. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so especially like people will come in to see me and they're maybe they're coming in for something else. Like they're having urinary leaking or they're having pain with sex or they're having uh, constipation, different things. And this is a standard, um, this is a standard test that we check people for prolapse. 
And I would say really three out of, this is just, Deborah, this is such an estimate, but okay. I'd say like 75% of people, I, I would kind of agree with that study, like have some kind of, some kind of prolapse. And then maybe 25% are at that a grade three. Rarely am I seeing someone with a grade four. Mm, so okay. I think most of the time, like a grade four is an indication for surgical intervention if they're able to have surgery. Uh, there's, there's varying schools of thought out there on grade threes. Like I personally have a grade three and I'm managing it 100% well doing conservative things, but there's like providers out there that are like, Oh, if you have a grade three automatic surgery, they're not even doing pelvic PT first. So just out, Hey, everyone out there, if you have a grade three and you don't want surgery, there's a lot of options. Yeah. Maybe look for a different uh, person that you're consulting with to see if you get a second opinion. So what are some of, you mentioned a couple of the symptoms. What might somebody typically feel that might they might question because I feel like oftentimes things are just said, Oh, you just had a baby. Of course you feel X, Y, and Z. And for me, it was a sense of heaviness and feeling like, Ooh, is something going to kind of fall? Not that anything actually fell out, but it just felt like there was something at the vaginal opening and heaviness. (laughs) Yeah. Those are the two key cardinal signs of prolapse, pelvic heaviness and a vaginal bulge. So, uh, just feeling like, uh, I feel like something's going to fall out. I feel heavy. I feel pressure. Uh, and then if you look down there and you see some different tissue at the vaginal opening, that would be like a vaginal bulge. Sometimes you can see the vaginal bulge and sometimes you you may not be able to see it, but like if you're in the shower and you're washing yourself down there and you feel some different tissue down there, um, and, and oh, something that is kind of a confirmation would be like if you take your hand and you kind of put it between your legs and you push up and in, like, does that feel good? Does that lift your pelvic floor and those organs? Does that take some of that heaviness and pressure off? That doesn't necessarily mean you have prolapse, but that's um, that can be very helpful for people with prolapse to do that external lift the the support from outside. Interesting. All right. So we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, let's talk about how someone, if they suspect they have prolapse, how exactly can they check to see what's going on? All right. We're going to take a super quick break. We'll be right back. Rev up the savings at JCPenney's Power Penny Days. Starting Wednesday, wrap up huge deals like Home Expressions Quick Dry Bath Towels, only $5. Stock up on fresh lineups of teas and tanks. Women's styles start at $9. And kids' thereabouts teas start at $7. Plus, bring home extra bling. Yes, please, lab created gemstones, only $13 while they last. JCPenney, make everybody count. Offers valid on select styles 410 to 414. Power Penny deals excluded from coupons. Other exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details. Rev up the savings at JCPenney's Power Penny Days. Starting Wednesday, wrap up huge deals like Home Expressions Quick Dry Bath Towels, only $5. Stock up on fresh lineups of teas and tanks. Women's styles start at $9. And kids' thereabouts teas start at $7. Plus, bring home extra bling. Yes, please, lab created gemstones, only $13 while they last. JCPenney, make everybody count. Offers valid on select styles 410 to 414. Power Penny deals excluded from coupons. Other exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details. All right. So somebody has felt some of these symptoms and they want to know before they make an appointment with a pelvic floor PT or you're a gynecologist, how can they check themselves? Mm-hmm. So I would like to preface this by saying you cannot self-diagnose prolapse. Okay. That needs to be diagnosed by a healthcare provider, but you can check for a vaginal bulge, which is one of the key signs of prolapse. Okay. So I think my, my favorite way is to do it in standing because like we were saying earlier, many times a prolapse can be missed when you're lying down because you don't have the weight of gravity. Remember that floor uh, is holding up those organs. And when you're lying down, the floor is kind of on slack, right? You don't have the weight of gravity and the weight of the organs. So stand, uh, you, you need to take your pants off, take your panties off. So your bottom, it, your, your lower body is exposed. Okay. So do this in a private, private space. 
get a stool or maybe even the side of a bathtub. And so one foot is going to go up on a stool. The other one is standing uh, normally. And then separate your legs. Grab a mirror, okay? And you're going to put that mirror down in between your legs and you're looking at your perineum and your vulva. And if you've never looked at your vulva, there's lots of resources out there too on how to identify the different structures. But what you will want to do is to separate your outer lips, separate your inner lips and find the vaginal opening. So you may even want to like put a finger inside the vagina to say, okay, yes, I've identified where the vagina is. This is the vagina. Okay. Take that finger out and use that mirror to visualize the vagina. So you may need to kind of with one hand, you're separating the labia and the other hand, you're using that mirror and just at rest. Do you see any tissue there? Uh, or does it look like there's something coming out? And then what you do is you cough. So cough. <laughs> Right. And when you cough, does, is there like any tissue that kind of comes out quickly or descends slightly and then kind of pops back up after you cough? And then you bear down. I actually hate prolapse testing because this is the opposite of what we want you to do in daily life, right? But for testing purposes, this is what we need you to do. You're going to bear down. Like you're going to say, ah, like you're pushing to have a bowel movement or pushing to have a baby. You're pushing. Okay. And when you push, what do you see? Do you see tissue that descends down? Do you see a bulge? And if you do, if the tissue comes down or the you see a bulge coming out of the, the vagina, China, then that's one sign that you may have a uh, prolapse and need to get checked out. So say someone has now done that. They've looked, they're like, yep, there's something there. They've coughed. They've, they've pressed down, had a little pressure. What should be their next steps? Make an appointment with the person that generally does your pelvic, like your annual pelvic exam. So that's where I would start with that person, um, uh, uh, OBGYN or a midwife or a nurse practitioner, they're all great at checking. Now for advanced uh, testing, like a urologist and a urogynecologist and OBGYNs that have, uh, you know, specialize in this area, then uh, those would be the providers that are the, um, you know, the most expert at testing for pelvic organ prolapse. So you go in and you get tested and you get your grade and you get uh, what organs are, are prolapsing. Is it just one? Is it just the bladder? Is it two? Is it three? Do you have a multi-compartment prolapse? I would like to jump back to one other symptom of sure. prolapse yeah. that I didn't uh, include earlier is when you're pooping and if you feel like, ah, oh, I feel like I have poop in there, but I just can't empty it out. And if you take your thumb or your finger and you put it inside your vagina and kind of press up and back towards your rectum, and that helps you to poop it's very likely that you have a rectocele, which is where the rectum is prolapsing. So that's another, another real indicator. Cause we'll have people, that's, that's a technique that we teach people with rectocele how to poop. You know, if you, if you feel like you're not emptying all the way, this is one thing that you can do. So it's like you're pushing the poop out from pressing up into the vagina. Uh -huh. like, it's like this poop has kind of gotten stuck in a pocket there. Huh. And so you're putting your finger into the vagina and kind of pushing that pocket of stool up and back. So it goes back into its channel to empty out. So you're giving that canal kind of support there. So would someone with rectocele, the rectal prolapse, are they more likely to be constipated? They are, but I would just, I would rectocele and rectal prolapse are two different things. Oh, please explain. Uh -huh. Cause I, yeah. I misunderstood so, so that. Rectocele is where the rectum is prolapsing into the vagina. Okay. okay. That, that, that back wall, yeah. the posterior wall, but a rectal prolapse is actually where the rectum, remember that sock analogy. Yes. So that's where the actual rectum is coming out of the anus. Oh, 
Okay. And so, yeah, that's um, not anything that we want either, but, uh, but a rectocele, I I would much rather have a rectocele than a rectal prolapse. Yeah. All right. Thank you for explaining that. I thought they were one of the same. See, I get to learn stuff too. This is exciting. All right. So now they've got, now someone hopefully has a prescription for some sort of rehab. What is that going to look like? And what's the healing process like? Yeah. So let's just so I want to back up to that provider. So you go yeah. to your provider, you say you're having the symptoms, they give you, hopefully they give you a grade and a stage. And if they don't see it lying down, ask to be checked in standing, ask to be checked in squatting. And I have to tell you that a lot of providers uh, don't typically test in these positions. And it is very awkward for the provider because the provider is literally having to squat on the ground <laughs> underneath you. Okay? Well, they, they, hopefully they're helping people birth that way. So, you know, they can, they can reorganize. I, themselves. Hopefully, but you know, it is an awkward position <laughs> for the provider. And but there's actually a statement from the American Urogynecological Society that says if people are having symptoms and you check them lying down, you need to check them in standing. So it's not I want you to be empowered to ask your provider that. It's not just me saying that. It's not just you saying that. There's actual statement from OGS that says this is the recommendation. Okay. So a lot of times uh, providers, especially if they are surgeons, aren't necessarily thinking rehab. Now, there is a growing movement for rehab, but some providers that may have been out there a long time might not be huge believers in rehab. So I want you, unless you have a grade four uh, prolapse, I would, if they don't offer you to go to pelvic floor physical therapy, I would ask for pelvic floor physical therapy. Mm. Hey, can I can I go, what do you think about pelvic floor physical therapy? And you can see what they think about it, but even if they think bad things about it, <laughs> ask for a referral. It's not a quick fix. And so we're going to talk about the healing process. Yeah. It's not a quick fix, but it has a uh, pro- uh, uh, fantastic results. And even if you end up choosing surgery later on, you're going to learn fantastic things about your body and how to do things. You're going to develop the pelvic floor strength and power and endurance you need to live your life. Yeah. Absolutely. And I bet, and this might be part of the healing conversation we have. I am curious if a lot of people then realize that maybe they had some dysfunctional breathing that added to their prolapse. Am I kind of getting ahead of myself? Exactly. (laughs) Totally. All right. So what, so then now this, hopefully they're, they've got a referral and they're now seeing a pelvic floor PT. What would rehab look like and what's that healing process like? Right. So I like to break it down into two key categories for the rehab. So you're managing pressure from above. So remember that floor and you have the weight of gravity, you have the weight of the organs, you have the weight of whatever's inside those organs, and then you have intra-abdominal pressure all pushing down. And then you have, so that's managing pressure. That's one category. And then you have improving support. So strengthening those pelvic floor muscles, lifting them up, uh, doing whatever we need to do from below to improve and optimize the support. And there's a lot of things that go into both of those categories. Mm -hmm. And breathing is definitely one of them. Posture, constipation. We're going to talk about risk factors here, I think, shortly. So uh, uh, reducing and eliminating risk factors, managing pressure, improving support. And then in terms of a timeline, uh, again, a lot of people say, oh, I went to two weeks. I did, I did, uh, you know, PT for two weeks and it, I didn't see any difference. Okay. Look, the research that's out there, it is really showing that you need to do this, uh, protocol like six months to get optimum results. So it's not even just six weeks. Will you see improvement at six weeks? Yes, you will. But it's going to take time to build that muscle strength and coordination and bulk back up. And and also the hips and the posture and the breathing, everything that goes into it. Yeah, I think I had (laughs) pelvic floor PT for about three months and I had homework from my pelvic floor PT (laughs) that I took very, I'm I'm very type A. I took it very seriously. I was doing my hip, my glute, my, I was like the whole 
area, the whole pelvic girdle, I was doing strengthening there. I had very specific pelvic floor techniques that she was teaching me. Luckily, my breathing was okay. (laughs) Yeah. That is such a good point because in these protocols, like you're doing the program at least five days a week. Now it doesn't take hours and hours. It could take about 13 to 15 minutes a day. So you just set aside that time. I did it twice a day. I did my little, my little thing twice (laughs) a day. I was very, I was also like, I got to get this under control. This is crazy. So I was super motivated and, and it definitely worked and helped. We'll talk a little later about breastfeeding because I really did see an improvement once I stopped breastfeeding, um, a significant improvement then, but it was, it, like you said, it's not, you know, two weeks, five sessions. Mm -hmm. It it Mm can take a lot. And, and it wasn't just, Oh, let's do some Kegels. Like there was a whole regimen around building all of the muscles. Absolutely. Yeah, I was a little shocked. All right. So, so now somebody has their routine. They've worked with a pelvic floor PT. Can, I'm going to dive and ask a little bit. I feel like Kegels get a bad rap, but I know when I was working pelvic floor retoning and, and rehab, not only did I have work on the adductors, the abductors, the glutes, like that whole situation, but I was, I was instructed to work toning and not just the superficial, like really lifting deep. And I feel like it gets a bad rap, but it it helped me. No, I agree completely. Kegels definitely get a bad, bad rap, but let's, let's back up with some terminology. Okay. So pelvic floor muscle training is training the pelvic floor muscles to do the right thing at the right time. Right. So whether that's lifting and supporting and closing off those canals so that urine doesn't leak and poop doesn't leak, or whether it's um, like, like, so it's kind of like a trampoline. So yes. when it needs to give, let's say that you are pooping. So you need to allow that sphincter to open and descend a little bit, right? So they need to do both. Yes. Uh, and pelvic floor muscle training is more than just Kegels. So generally when people think about Kegels, it's a quick little squeeze, a quick squeeze and release. So these protocols that have the most research for pelvic floor muscle training and pelvic organ prolapse, they are doing endurance contractions. So where you're holding it eight to 12 seconds, uh, they're doing quick contractions. They're doing a uh, rest period in between, and you're doing it in multiple positions. And I always incorporate breathing with that. And then once they've gotten that good, then we're adding activity and we're mm-hmm. adding motion to it. Uh, so, I'm so glad you brought that up because I do believe like there's this whole anti-Kegel movement. <laughs> well, I think it's about balance that we want. To, like you said, like a, I think of it like a jellyfish, like it undulates. We need it to lift yes. and we need it to soften, yes. you know, yes. like a trampoline. Absolutely. I like that. I like that. Yeah. And it's not like, so I think this anti-Kegel movement kind of came from just people being given a sheet of exercises here, go do Kegels and that fixes every pelvic floor dysfunction. And that's not the case, right? In fact, we know sometimes it can worsen. We know like if you're just tight, tight, tight. Yeah. Right. And if you have overactive pelvic floor muscles, then you need to really also focus on the lengthening component and the coordination component. But even with that category of people, you still need to strengthen because I find that overactive pelvic floor muscles that are kind of tense and aren't releasing are frequently weak as well. Mm -hmm. And so they need blood flow. They need strengthening. They need range of motion too. And then the lengthening and coordination piece. Yeah. So, all right. So what can make prolapse worse? Okay. So there really isn't great research on worsening prolapse, but there, there is research on, um, what creates or causes like risk factors for prolapse. Okay. So, um, we have different, different categories here. So one of the big things is constipation and straining. Okay. Um, we have vaginal deliveries, 
we have hypermobility, so connective tissue disorders. So like I'm, I was at risk for prolapse and didn't even know it because I'm a very stretchy, flexible person. Mm -hmm. I'm very hypermobile. And so, uh, understanding, Hey, I have this body type. I want to have a baby. Maybe I need to do some prevention things in advance to help prevent tearing and to help prevent, um, prolapse because, Tearing a severe tear, like a third or fourth degree tear, makes you, uh, your risk is higher for what we call a levator ani avulsion. And what that is, it's a deep tear of the deep pelvic floor muscles. And then that makes you at greater risk for prolapse. So it's kind of like a domino effect. Mm -hmm. So we can't say that a third or fourth degree tear increases your prolapse risk directly, but it's kind of indirectly. You're losing that that support system. So those are some of the key things, uh, menopause, and then how many babies you have. So you, the research does show that if you have more vaginal deliveries, you're more likely, you know, your risk of prolapse goes up. That doesn't mean that you will have it, but your risk goes up. What about, I mentioned dysfunctional breathing a little bit. What about the folks that are constantly pulling their navel to their spine and just kind of always sucking their stomach in? If that's creating a downward pressure it, without a corresponding support from above, then yes. But I don't have, like, I can't say. We don't have data that, on that. Yeah, we don't have data on that. Now, constipation, where you're pushing, mm -hmm. definitely. Uh, and then there is some research out there on people that are doing heavy lifting, like they were nurses' aides and doing a lot of heavy lifting. Uh and again, I would wonder, like, how are they lifting? Are they engaging their core and pelvic floor? Are they using their breath to, you know, probably not. So I had mentioned breastfeeding and you just mentioned menopause because I actually think of them very similarly because the estrogen is lower in both of those situations. How does that affect the healing process of prolapse? So there is not a solid answer on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, right. Okay. So let's just talk about the role of estrogen in the pelvic floor yeah. and the vulva and the vagina. So estrogen helps to make the tissue fluffy. I think that's the best word. Without estrogen, our our tissues kind of atrophy and they get thinner and they uh, aren't as juicy. Okay. So estrogen helps our tissue with kind of uh, the fluffy, juicy, pinkish, healthy tissue. That's great. Okay. And so yes, in breastfeeding, your estrogen is low in menopause, your estrogen is low. And so that's impacting the health of these tissues. Um, now, I don't have, so, so then you want to say, okay, well, if I took, like, if I started doing a local estrogen, like a estradiol or something, like a, a local, a local cream or some other type of getting localized estrogen to that tissue, would that help prolapse? And the research at this point is mixed. So like 50% is saying yes, 50% is saying no. And to me, look, I'm, I'm approaching menopause. I have a prescription for estradiol, right? Like I'm going to use some localized estrogen because if I have a, if it's a 50, 50 chance at this point, like the research out there is mixed. Why not try it? Can it's someone not, use that during breastfeeding? It's not increasing my risk of cancer and so forth. I can't answer that question for okay. you. They need to talk to their provider, but there are providers out there that are sub prescribing it for some huh. people. So mm -hmm. interesting. Okay. Yeah. So at what point might someone consider if the pelvic floor PT is working, but maybe they still have some prolapse, what point might someone want to consider a pessary or even surgery? A pessary might be worked into the beginning of your rehab because basically what a pessary is, think about a a tampon. So it's kind of like a silicone tampon and there's a lot of different shapes and sizes, but it's something that you insert into your vagina to help support the tissue. And so a lot of PTs are using this for prolapse during rehab. 
Um, so I've had clients that will put the pessary in, uh, before they're going to go on a run. So they'll put the pessary in and they'll, they'll, uh, put on some specialized shorts that kind of help lift the perineum from below. So they're getting that internal support. They're getting that external support. And then they're, um, going out and running for an hour and then they come back and they don't need it the rest of the day. So that's one, uh, touch point that pe- a pessary could be used. But if, you know, people aren't interested in pessary, or or maybe the PT thinks you don't need a pessary yet. Let's try all this other stuff first. Uh, then you you progress along the process. Uh, so in terms of a pessary, definitely a PT is a good person to help guide you with that and um, help make some recommendations for that. And then surgery, ultimately, I would say if you've done six months of consistent pelvic floor PT, you had a good program and you didn't see the outcome outcomes that you wanted, talk to your surgeon about other options. There's no shame in having surgery. Surgery can do things that pelvic floor PC can't in terms of tightening up the fascia and the ligaments. So if that's, uh, you know, if you, again, if you're not seeing the outcomes that you want, then, but you've done six months. I feel like whenever I think about surgery, I think of those commercials on TV that were like, if you had a pelvic mesh and it seems, it seems a little overwhelming. Yeah. I, I think, uh, I think surgery is overutilized for pelvic organ prolapse. You know, the recommendations out there for pelvic organ prolapse are that, you know, PT and pelvic floor muscle training is the number one recommendation. So unless it's so severe, like I said, the grade four prolapse or like where you have your intestines that are prolapsing, go to PT, you know, learn those things, do those things, build up your strength, build, figure out the right way to do things, have the PT work with you so that you can have, um, you know, your, your optimum chance of success and a better quality. I mean, when, when someone's pelvic floor, I can speak from my own experience when I did not understand what was happening with my pelvic floor, it stressed me out and it felt like it affected my quality of life until I figured it out and and got help and support. And now things are, are better, (laughs) but it can really like a black box down there. And you feel like it's failed you too. Like, or did I do something wrong? What did I do? You know, there's a lot of self guilt and provider guilt out there too. Yes. And it, what I really appreciate that you said is certain body types. Like I'm also a very bendy person. Mm-hmm. I pushed for hours. So like yes. when we take all that together, it wasn't a surprise in right. hindsight. You're like, of course right. there's some prolapse. Right. And when you look at third and fourth degree tears, there's things that increase your risk for third and fourth degree tears. There's during the birth process, there's things that increase your risk for levator ani avulsions in the birth process, like forceps and vacuums, mm-hmm. right? And just having a third or fourth degree tear. So I love those guidelines out there that help, uh, that help providers and can help patients. Like, hey, these are objective things you can do during pregnancy, during labor and birth that you can do and that your provider can do to help reduce your risk of tearing. Uh, to, of having a severe perineal tear. And that's what we want to avoid. Absolutely. Because if you can help to keep those structures intact or less impacted by a deep tear, then they're more likely to function better, right? So it let's also sense. put episiotomies in there. We're talking about um, forceps and vacuums. We're hopefully having providers that are not grabbing the scissors too quickly. Right, right, right. But I would say I'd rather have a medial lateral episiotomy than a third or fourth degree tear, you know? So, um, there's that. Yes. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, what is one final tip or piece of advice you would like to offer new and expectant parents? We'll be right back. Rev up the savings at JCPenney's Power Penny Days. Starting Wednesday, wrap up huge deals like Home Expressions Quick Dry Bath Towels, only $5. Stock up on fresh lineups of teas and tanks. Women's styles start at $9. And kids' thereabouts teas start at $7. Plus, bring home extra bling. Yes, please, lab created gemstones, only $13 while they last. JCPenney, make everybody count. Offers valid on select styles 410 to 414. Power Penny deals excluded from coupons. Other exclusions apply. See store or jcp.com for details. So what is, what's popping into your mind? What do you want to leave us with? <laughs> Don't be afraid. 
Okay, so I know prolapse sounds just terrifying. Like, ah, I don't want to have a baby because uh, so many people have this, whatever, whatever. First of all, you can have prolapse even without having a baby. Um, but just don't be afraid. You can have a wonderful, absolutely fantastic quality of life with pelvic organ prolapse. There's many things that can help you get there. So just don't be afraid. Know that there's hope and there's help, whether you're thinking about this in the future or whether you're experiencing symptoms now. Mm. Where, can people, where can people find your work? A few places. So I'm on Instagram as my pelvic floor muscles and also on YouTube with that same channel, my pelvic floor muscles. And then I have a website called mypfm.com where there's also other resources and so forth. And we have on, on mypfm.com, we have a find a PT locator so you can find a pelvic PT near you. Or I'll also be starting some group coaching here in the next couple of weeks for prolapse, for leaking. And so if you're someone that may not be able to go to an in-person pelvic PT or that doesn't work for you for whatever reason, there are online resources to help as well. That is so great. And I will make sure I have links to all that as well as links to the videos. So if people just can't get in their head, like, <laughs> how are these organs lined up? What? We will yes. show you. <laughs> yes. yes, absolutely. Well, this has been absolutely delightful. I love your enthusiasm. I love all your knowledge and that you you offer it in a way that doesn't feel shameful and that it's just digestible and people can feel empowered to take charge of their body. So thank you. Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you for the invitation to be here. And thank you to everybody that has stayed with us and listened. And I hope that this was empowering. This has been an episode of Yoga Birth Babies, produced by Prenatal Yoga Center. You can catch us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope. I'm Deb Flaschenberg. Thanks for listening. Hello, it is Ryan, and we could all use an extra bright spot in our day, couldn't we? Just to make up for things like sitting in traffic, doing the dishes, counting your steps, you know, all the mundane stuff. That is why I'm such a big fan of Chumba Casino. Chumba Casino has all your favorite social casino style games that you can play for free anytime, anywhere with daily bonuses. That should brighten your day a little. Actually, a lot. So sign up now at ChumbaCasino.com. That's ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. BTW. Void. We're prohibited by law. See terms and conditions. 18 plus.